All right, so we're going to get back into the age of Jackson now and talk a little bit about this guy, Andrew Jackson. And I've said it before, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it again to you. In the interest of fairness, I kind of, I kind of like this guy. Uh, I don't like everything he did. He did some really terrible things. He was probably the craziest president we ever had. But, you know, there's things that I really, really kind of, kind of respect him for. Uh, so let's get to know this guy, Uncle Andy here, Andrew Jackson. The beginning of this is the same slides as the end of the War of 1812 slides. So if you see the first couple slides, if you're like, we've already heard this, well, yeah, you have. But we're kind of setting the mood again. So 1824, you had four strong candidates for president. They're up there. John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and William H. Crawford are all running for president of the United States. This is the end of the era of good feelings, that time period of only one party. So they're all running as Democratic Republicans or Jeffersonian Republicans, whatever title you want to, want to give them. Adams is the candidate from the Northeast. He's the Puritan candidate, the, uh, uh, the urban candidate, very, very popular in the Northeast, absolutely hated in the South and West. William H. Crawford is the candidate from Georgia. He's the Southern candidate. And he probably would have done quite well, except he had a stroke in the middle of the campaign and is paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, he does not drop out of the election, however. He continues to run for president while paralyzed. Um, and then you had Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay, who were both Westerners. Uh, Jackson from Tennessee and Clay from Kentucky. Uh, Jackson was without a doubt the most popular man in the country. He was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. Remember, he was the one that uh, defeated the British at New Orleans and uh, mailed General Sir Robert <laughs> Packingham or back, to, uh, back to, the, to the King of England in a keg of whiskey. Uh, he's, a, he's a loved man in the United States. Edward Packingham, my brother. Uh, but even though he's the most popular man in the world, or in the United States, People in this time period tended to vote their section, their region. So all of your Southerners are going to vote for Crawford. All of your Northeasterners are going to vote for, uh, for, for Adams. And the Western vote is going to get split between Jackson and Clay. Jackson's going to get the most, but they're still going to split the vote. At the end of the day, Andrew Jackson gets the most votes but he doesn't win a majority. He doesn't win 50% plus one. And according to the 12th Amendment, if a president does not receive a majority of votes, the top three candidates are sent to the House of Representatives. Well, Jackson comes in first and Adams comes in second and then William H. Crawford, even with a stroke, comes in third and Henry Clay comes in fourth. So if the top three are sent, you think to yourself, Henry Clay is not important anymore. But it turns out that even though Henry Clay is not up for the presidency because he came in fourth, he's going to be the most important man in this, in this whole system because Henry Clay is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives is going to choose the president from the top three candidates. So a deal is made that has gone down in history as the corrupt bargain. John Quincy Adams tells Henry Clay, if you will throw your support in the House of Representatives behind me, I promise that I will appoint you Secretary of State. And that's exactly what happens. As a result, John Quincy Adams lost the popular vote and still became president because the House of Representatives elected him. Henry Clay is made Secretary of State, and people wonder about that. Why would you want to be Secretary? Well, why would you choose that position? Well, at this time in history, that was the natural stepping stone to the presidency. Think about it. Jefferson had been Secretary of State. <coughs> Madison had been Secretary of State. Monroe had been Secretary of State. And John Quincy Adams was previously Secretary of State. So four of the first six presidents were Secretaries of State before they became president. Okay? So it's kind of like saying, 
you make me president now, Henry Clay, I'll make you president in eight years. Okay? It doesn't turn out that way, but that was his, that was his thought. Adams' administration was a disaster. He's not a liked person. He's too much like his daddy. You remember John Adams was obnoxious in this life. Nobody liked him. So much so that even though John Adams was the architect of independence, they had to get Richard Henry Lee to propose it because people would vote against it just because they didn't like Adams. Well, John Quincy's the same way. He was, a, uh, he was probably the best prepared president we ever had. The guy spoke several languages, one of which was Hebrew, uh, fluently. He had been raised in the presidency. His father was president. He was raised in the White House. He'd been ambassador to Russia. He'd been, been, been secretary of state to two presidents. He had been uh, uh, a, a, a U.S. congressman at one point. He'd been a state representative. This guy was born to be president, and he did a terrible job because he couldn't work with people. He was unwilling to compromise, just like his daddy. He tried to do some pretty smart things. He, uh, he believed that we should deal fairly with the American Indians. In fact, he, he argued that Indians were people, and we should treat them as such. Well, that's going to make everybody in the South and West mad. He also thought we should end slavery. That's going to make everybody in the South mad. He thought that we should build a national university and a national observatory because it was important to educate our people. That's going to piss the South off because they don't, they don't want to spend the money on it. He wants to raise taxes to build roads, bridges, and tunnels in the South. That's going to make the North mad because they don't want their taxes raised. And they already have roads. They don't need new roads. So by the time he finishes his presidency, he's made the whole country mad at it. Okay? As a result, historians almost always rank John Quincy Adams' presidency as among the worst presidents, of, presidents we ever had. Yeah? So you say like he tried to do all this stuff. Did he actually do anything in his presidency? Well, he did actually do some things. He stopped uh, he stopped selling land cheap in the West, which is going to make Westerners mad. But it was a good idea because that was causing inflation. And he gave rights to blacks to, to, to trial by jury, which was a pretty big thing. The rest of it he couldn't do because Congress stopped him. Good question. So he has a very failed presidency. Okay, He's usually ranked as the second or third worst president in history. And when you're behind Warren Harding and Ulysses S. Grant, you're in pretty bad shape, okay? So, what has changed? Clearly, things are different. Because a generation earlier, John Quincy Adams would have been fine as president. They expected that kind of staid, arrogant attitude. But, by the 1820s, we're in a populist period. I'm going to use that term populism, and we're going to hear that term from now all the way through about March, okay? Because populism is a big thing for the next several lectures. So let's talk about what it means. Populism comes from the word root word popular, which just means the people, okay? That's why if you're popular in school, the people like you. That's why the population is a count of the people, okay? That just means the people. And sovereignty means who rules, okay? A sovereign is another name, an old name for a king or a queen. So popular sovereignty just means the people rule, okay? It's where our power is, uh, is, is granted directly by the people. And this is a new populist era. By the 1820s, they had gotten rid of property restrictions in most places to vote. As a result, most people, at least most white men, could vote for the first time ever. And here's the deal. We like to vote for people that are like us. It's still true today. It's the only way you can explain the election of a Donald Trump, a George W. Bush, a Bill Clinton. We like Bubba, okay? It's how we, and, and to, to a lesser extent, even a Barack Obama. We like somebody that's like us whenever it's election time. Well, the fact that there were more common people, more average people voting, meant 
that we were starting to like straight shooters, plain spoken people. Uh, politicians that at least pretended to have humble backgrounds became popular. Sometimes they didn't really have humble backgrounds, but they sold themselves as commoners. Particularly Indian fighters were incredibly popular at this time period. Uh, guys like William Henry Harrison, that's him at the top left there. We remember him from the War of 1812. He was the guy that defeated Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe. He's going to ride that into the presidency a, uh, a couple of decades later. He's going to be very popular, particularly in the Indiana area. He pretends to be a common person. He says, I'm just like you. I'm, a, I'm an average guy. In reality, he grew up in Virginia. His grandfather, or, or his father, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He, he grew up very wealthy, but he sold himself as a commoner, and we believed him. Uh, the next guy there at the top right, Andrew Jackson, who we're going to talk about this whole time period, he really was a commoner. He was born in Carolina, in the Carolinas. He, uh, he grew up very, very poor, uh, went out west, and was a self-made man. And we'll talk about everything he does a little later on. But he is probably the greatest of this time period of the, of the heroes. <coughs> At the bottom left there is, is David Crockett, or Davy Crockett. By the way, he never would have called himself Davy. Uh, that was something that was made up later on. He was David. He was uh, he was uh, uh, he, he he was also a, a fairly wealthy man, upper middle class, lower upper class. He did well, but he had gone out west and tested himself against the frontier and fought the Indians, and then had began uh, writing stories about himself and kind of created his own his own fables, his own folk stories. So when you hear the Davy Crockett stories. If you watch the old Walt Disney Davy Crockett movies, awesome movies, by the way. Everybody should watch them, but not for the history. The history is terrible. But they tell the stories of this guy where he sold himself as a commoner. He used to appear in his buckskins just to kind of appear like everybody else. And he rode that into the gov I'm sorry, into the uh, uh, United States Congress. He got elected from Tennessee. Uh, he only served one term in Congress, and... He went afoul of then President Jackson and uh, famously gave the greatest speech ever on the House of Representatives. Uh, Davy Crockett, after he lost his re-election bid, he asked if he could speak one more time to the Congress. And they said, certainly, you can. And he stepped out there on the floor of the Congress. He raised up a glass full of whiskey and he said, you may all go to hell, I'm going to Texas. And he left and came to Texas and died at the Alamo. Uh, and then we got Sam Houston there at the, at the bottom right. Uh, we like Sam. We love Sam Houston in Texas. We built a giant statue of it uh, right outside of Huntsville. In fact, I'm, I'm still angry. That was the tallest freestanding statue in the world until about five years ago when the Fort Worth Zoo built a giraffe that's bigger than it. And I think we should go blow that giraffe up because no, nobody should be bigger. If I was the sculptor of that Sam Houston statue, I'd go put a top hat on him, uh, just to reclaim it. But Sam Houston is an interesting character. He, uh, he ran away from home while still a young teenager. And he didn't want to be a shopkeeper like his parents. So he went, went and lived with the Indians. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, today we like, he ran off to the circus. That's kind of what he did. He ran off to live with the Indians. And he spent most of his teenage years there because he didn't want to get a job. He didn't want to be a shopkeeper. He wanted to fish and hunt and chase women. And that's what he did. In fact, he even married an Indian woman. Uh, but he returns back to, to, to settled life, to the, the white lifestyle, uh, becomes, a, becomes a soldier, uh, and distinguishes himself as an Indian fighter under Colonel Andrew Jackson in the Creek Wars. And when Jackson gets elected to, con or to the governorship of Tennessee, Sam Houston takes his seat in Congress. When Jackson gets elected president of the United States in 1828, Houston is going to take the governorship of Tennessee. Uh, he's on track to be president one day. And then he screws up. 
uh, Sam Houston had a serious drinking problem. His, uh, his second wife left him for another man. And uh, while he was governor, they were having a big governor's ball and they were waiting for Sam, Sam Houston to come down, expecting this guy to come down in a tuxedo looking very professional. But Sam Houston got drunk and he came down the steps dressed in complete Indian garb, uh, drinking whiskey and making a fool of himself. It's so bad that he's forced to resign the governorship. He flees, uh, he flees Tennessee and ends up coming to Texas where he is uh, made commander of the Texas Revolutionary Army, defeats Santana at uh, the Battle of San Jacinto, is our first elected president. Uh, he's an interesting guy because he, he's the only man in history to do this. He was governor of two states, governor of, of, of Tennessee and governor of Texas. He was a congressman from Tennessee. He was later on a senator from Texas. He was president of the Republic of Texas and an ambassador. He did everything. And by the way, in 1860, when Abraham Lincoln won the presidency of the United States, Sam Houston was who they, the Republicans wanted to run, and Sam Houston refused to run for the presidency. He probably would have been president of the United States in 1860 if he'd have ran. So he's an interesting character. And very characteristic of the idea of the Jacksonian politician, the self-made man. Uh, under Jacksonian democracy, it was genuinely believed that there was no job so hard that the average American could not do it. Andrew Jackson famously said, and I love this quote, because he found the part, he found the new Democratic Party. He says, if there's a job that a Democrat can't do, get rid of the job. Okay? Uh, and while I'm not a Democrat, or a Republican for that matter, I, uh, I like, I, I can respect the attitude. All right. So 1828 comes along, and the world's changed a little bit. Populism has changed the voting patterns. And we have at least a partial repeat of 24. John Quincy Adams is going to run for re-election, and Andrew Jackson is going to run for election in his own right. But the other two candidates aren't there anymore. There is no William Crawford pulling the Southern vote. There is no Henry Clay pulling the Western vote. So your choices are the Western candidate or the Northeastern candidate. What's the South gonna do? Well, what do they have more in common with? They have more in common with the West than the Northeast. So the Southern vote's gonna drop to Jackson. This was a dirty, dirty, dirty election. Probably the dirtiest election in American history. And that's hard to imagine after the one we just went through. Okay, this one was worse. Let's look at the accusations. Andrew Jackson is now running as a Democrat. He's founded a brand new party. He is the founder of the Democrat Party. Uh, he accuses Adams of being pro-British, of siding with the British too much. Well, that's a big accusation to uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson hates the British. When he was a young boy, probably eight years old, thereabouts, Andrew Jackson uh, defends his, I think I told you this story before, mm -hmm. defended his mother from a red coat mm -hmm. who was trying to rape her. And he's got a scar on his, on his, on his uh, cheek for the rest of his life. Her. He accuses John Quincy Adams of being a monarchist. That means of wanting to be king. Well, guys, I don't think John Quincy Adams wanted to be king. But let's think about it. His daddy, John Adams, was president. Now he's president. That sounds like a, like a king and a prince, doesn't it? And he was clearly raised to be king. And he was arrogant and acted a bit like a king. So there may be some truth there. Um, and then uh, the last one is ridiculous to me because I you know, owned a pool hall for years. But uh, they accused him of gambling. Um, and the reason he was, they accused him of this is because John Quincy Adams had a billiards table, a pool table, put in the White House. And in Andrew Jackson's mind, the only reason to have a pool table is to gamble on it. So he must be gambling. John Quincy Adams is a Puritan. He's not gambling. He's just playing pool. Okay? Uh, so that's a ridiculous accusation. Now let's look at the accusations that John Quincy Adams made. These are the ones that get fun. 
John Quincy Adams is now running as a national Republican. So we have two parties, the Democrats and the national Republicans. He's also the New England candidate, the Northeastern candidate. Uh, he accuses Jackson of having a gambling problem. This is absolutely true. Andrew Jackson raised racehorses and gambled on them his whole life. He had won and lost fortunes gambling. Andrew Jackson would, you know, was one of those guys that if you stepped outside and there were three birds on telephone telephone line, he would bet you which one flew off first, okay? This guy was a gambler, no doubt about it. And when they accused him of it, Jackson kind of went, yeah, I gambled. And people accepted it. The second one, they accused Andrew Jackson of murder. Whoa, murder. In the middle of a presidential speech, John Quincy Adams stands up, and I love this. He says, if you elect this man, Andrew Jackson, president, you will be electing a man who has killed at least three people in cold blood in his life. And Andrew Jackson stood up and he slapped the table and he said, that's a damned lie. I've killed a lot more than that. He wasn't mad about the accusation. He was mad that he wasn't getting full credit. Okay. And what he meant was in duels. He had killed at least three people in duels for insulting his wife. He had killed, uh, killed at least two others in duels for insulting him. He had also, as a general, uh, ordered people executed, like in Florida, we saw where he executed the British soldiers. So he is, he's done a lot. Now the argument is, is that murder? Andrew Jackson would say it's not murder, but it is killing. And I killed people. And the American people went, okay, we like this guy. <laughs> he kills people that need killing, okay? And you know, it's the West. The West is kind of like Texas. He needed killing as, a, as an adequate defense, okay? Um, now we get to the rough ones. The murder is not the rough one. The third one. They accuse Andrew Jackson's mother of being a prostitute. Wow. In fact, they, they question whether Andrew Jackson's mother had had Andrew Jackson do an illegitimate affair. Jackson's furious. He challenged, finally, he challenged John Quincy Adams to a duel over this. Adams did, did not accept. Um, why would he do this? Well, the accusation is based on the rape of his mother. And in those days, if you had sex outside of marriage, you were a whore, you were a prostitute, okay? And since his mother was raped, she had sex outside of marriage. Now, can you imagine that Andrew Jackson is not going to be happy with this? Uncle Andy is not going to like that at all. Okay. The last one, they accused Andrew Jackson and his wife, Rachel, of committing adultery, of having sex outside of marriage. There's some truth to this, but in a really weird way. Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, was married to someone else. A man that abused her and abandoned her. This young, at that point, country lawyer, Andrew Jackson, colonel in the army, but a lawyer, meets Rachel. She has been abandoned by her husband. He left. He's been gone for years. She filed divorce paperwork. The paperwork was, 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 was sent off. And Jackson began courting Rachel. They were married in a frontier wedding. Now, if you don't know what that is, it was really hard out in the frontier to get judges to come and, and get the legal paperwork. So they had something called a frontier wedding where if you had two witnesses to you that y'all were living together and, uh, and, and expressed your, your uh, uh, did the oaths, it was a legal wedding 
and you could then go to a courthouse with, with signed documents from those witnesses, and you could have it dated and uh, to, to when you were married, okay? It's called a frontier wedding. Not at all uncommon. Most weddings were frontier weddings. Well, they had a frontier wedding. They got married. Everything is fine. About 10 years later, the ex-husband, Jackson is now on the, uh, on the rise politically, and the ex-husband shows up and says that he never signed the document. So what happened was the divorce papers were filed, but the husband never signed off on them. So their divorce was never official at the courthouse. Uh, so Andrew Jackson has been living as, a, as man and wife with Rachel for 10 years while she was still legally married to her first husband. Now, is that just a paperwork error? Probably, probably. But legally, have they committed adultery? They have. The embarrassment on Rachel was, was very, very high. Andrew Jackson wins the presidency, but his wife doesn't get to enjoy it. Rachel died of a heart attack before, uh, before Jackson won the day. Andrew Jackson will spend the rest of his life blaming John Quincy Adams and the Adamsites for killing his wife. He said she died of a broken heart, that the stress of that killed her. And there's probably some truth to that. But Andrew Jackson does win the day, 178 to 83. This is a picture of John Marshall swearing in Andrew Jackson uh, at the White House, just kind of, kind of to set the mood for us. And Jackson has a party. Guys, most party, most presidents have inaugural balls where they get dressed up and go to go out and dance fancy. I like to call this the inaugural bowl because his inauguration was more like a Super Bowl party than a than a ball. Okay. Remember, Andrew Jackson's a common man. He literally invites anybody to the White House that wants to come for his inauguration. And instead of dancing the ballroom music and drinking wine, he served beer and cheese. And they just partied. His vice president, a guy named John C. Calhoun of, of the Carolinas, South Carolina, he doesn't like this at all. He feels like this is unbecoming of a president. The party is out of control. Jackson is nearly trampled by people wanting to meet him and shake his hands. People feel like Andrew Jackson has saved the nation. That night, the party got so, was so strong, they couldn't get everybody out of the house, out of the White House. So Jackson spends his first night as president sleeping in a hotel. And they had to sneak him out the back door to the hotel to get him a place to stay. It was like rock stars are in town. Okay? Uh, they trashed the White House. They literally took furniture out of the White House and set it up outside. It was like the Clampets go to Maui. Okay? This is not a, 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 a good situation. Uh, there's, there's a picture of the people outside partying at the at the White House. I don't know if y'all can see it or not, but there's there's a guy up there on the steps carrying a, a couch down. That's the kind of thing they were doing. So what do we know about this guy? We've kind of gotten to know him a little bit, but I want to talk about Old Hickory. That's his nickname, Old Hickory. And that sounds like a funny nickname to us today. Why would you have that? But in this time period. The hardest object most people knew was a hickory tree. If you've ever had to split firewood and had to split hickory, you know it's a hard wood. And this guy was hard like a hickory stick. He was, he was tough. And he was the personification of the New West. He, uh, let's look at what this guy manages to survive. In his life, he gets dysentery. Dysentery kills about 90% of people that, that get it at this time. He survives it. He gets malaria, survives it. He gets tuberculosis, and survives it. He has lead poisoning from two bullets that that went through, or that got lodged in his body during duels. 
that he didn't have removed and the lead poisoned him, he survived that. That may be why he was crazy, by the way. Lead poisoning will make you nuts. I love this story about the duel. There was a guy that insulted him. His name was Crittenden. Insulted Andrew Jackson. And he was known as the greatest shot in Tennessee. Nobody, he had killed all these people in duels. And Andrew Jackson wanted to, uh, you know, knew he couldn't outshoot him. So he wore that big cape over him to make himself look bigger. And he went out there to fight, to, 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 to duel, with, duel with the guy. And when they drew, Andrew Jackson refused to fire. He just stood there. And when the guy fired, he shot Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson didn't flinch. He wanted the guy to think he missed. And the guy had never missed before, so he wigged out. And Andrew Jackson took his time and shot him and killed him. Then he went to the hospital. He pretended like he wasn't shot. That's how tough this guy is, okay? Uh, he's a self-taught lawyer and a judge. Uh, he was a circuit judge, which means... He was a traveling judge that went around from, from community to community. He was elected congressman. He also, while he was a Western aristocrat, a very wealthy man, he spoke the language of the common man. Andrew Jackson reminds me of some of my students. In the sense that Andrew Jackson, y'all will appreciate this. Andrew Jackson once told John Marshall that he was smarter than him. John Marshall was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, okay? And Andrew Jackson said, I am smarter than you, sir. And they asked him why, and he said, because you can only spell words in one way, and I can spell them in more than one way. Some of you can spell words in more than one way. I've read your tests. You were very, very smart, okay? Andrew Jackson saw that as a sign of intelligence. Uh, he believed in the power of the people. He was a Jacksonian Democrat. But once he becomes president, he acts a lot like a king. He, he, he exercises his power in a very uh, abrupt manner. Uh, the conservatives don't like him. They call him King Mob. Because he is able to move the electorate, move the elect, the electoral process in a, in an interesting way, and he can get the people to do what he wants to. Andrew Jackson could do anything, and the people loved him for it. I mean, this is a guy who won the presidency by saying, "I killed lots of people." Okay, they love him. This is an editorial cartoon, and I like to put it up here because. I've seen it on the star test before, for one thing, but uh, but I think it goes to explain the fear of Andrew Jackson in a lot of ways. The cartoonist clearly does not like Andrew Jackson. You can tell because they've drawn him as a king. And it, I don't know if y'all can see it or not, but he's stepping on a torn up copy of the Constitution. Okay? And it says, of veto memory, had I been consulted, born to command King Andrew the first. And what the artist is saying is Andrew Jackson is stomping on the Constitution, he's stomping on our rights, and he's using his veto power illegally. Andrew Jackson vetoed more laws from Congress than the six presidents before him added together. Okay? He uses the executive power a lot. I think he vetoed 14 in his first term, which is a lot. Not a lot today, but it was a lot then. One of the things that Andrew Jackson gets credit for, even though he didn't invent it, is something called the spoils system. That's a term that was easy to understand once upon a time because we used to use the word spoils a lot, but now it seems funny to us because most of us don't know what spoils are. But there's an old term, the spoils of war. To the victor go the spoils. All that means is the treasure, okay? The reward, the award. Well, the spoils system is the idea that you reward people who were loyal to you and helped you get elected 
with government jobs. The idea is we won, now the spoils of war are the people that got me here get government jobs. So how that would work is if, if I was running for office and, and Brett over there came up to me and said, hey, I want you to win this office, Mr. Alberts, and I got a bunch of people that I can convince to vote for you. I'd say, all right, fine. If I win, you can be a judge. So he's going to go work hard to get me up there. But when he wins, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appoint him to something. And that gets attacked a lot because it's almost like you're buying a position. But the other side of it, it's very efficient. Because do you think Brett's going to be loyal to me whenever I, he gets up there? Yeah, very loyal. Maybe not Brett. Anybody else would be. Because I gave him a job. He owes me something, you know? So it, it, it's pretty effective and efficient. Jackson was a big believer in the spoils system. Uh, he gets credit for it because he was unapologetic about it. He came right out and said, yeah, the people that are loyal to me get jobs. If you're not loyal to me, you don't have a job anymore. If you sided with the other guy, you were fired. He also did something called rotation in office. Where, all right, you get to be you get to be Secretary of State for this term, but at the end of the term, you're out of here because I got somebody else I got to give a job to. Okay, he would rotate people in and out of it. Uh, sometimes this is good, sometimes it's bad. We had guys like Samuel Swartwell. What a terrible name! If your name, if your last name is Swartwell, you need to have that changed immediately. Uh, Samuel Swartwell was appointed Customs Commissioner for. For New York. Uh, in this position, he stole a million dollars from the city. So sometimes it's really, really bad. Okay? I know I'm going fast. If I go too fast, y'all let me know. The single biggest issue in the Jackson administration is the tariff issue. If you understand tariffs, you understand this whole time period. All a tariff is is a tax on imported goods. Its purpose is to make foreign goods more expensive so people will buy more American goods. That's the whole reason behind it. Well, the tariff of 1828 was passed. Now, this, was, this wasn't Jackson's tariff. This was pushed through under John Quincy Adams. But Jackson agrees with it. The tariff of 1828 was, was passed. And it put a 45% tax on imported goods. That's massive. 45%? If something cost $1,000, all of a sudden it cost $1,500? $1,450? So, it's a big tax. People in the North liked it. Why? Because they're manufacturers. They're making goods. This means that you're making their competition more expensive. People in the South and West that had to pay for everything hated it. Because it made products more expensive for them. So 1832 comes along, and, and, and Jackson, Jackson lowers the tariff, but he doesn't lower it significantly. He lowers it to 35%. That's a pretty big reduction from 45 to 35, but it's still a massive tariff. His vice president and he are no longer getting along. John C. Calhoun is the vice president, and they hate each other. So John C. Calhoun, that's him at the bottom left down there. Calhoun decides to take on the president. So now we have the vice president taking on the president politically. And he writes a letter. Now, he writes it anonymously. He doesn't sign his name to it because it's Andrew Jackson and you don't want to get shot, okay? But he writes this letter called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. And in this letter, John C. Calhoun says that the state of South Carolina will nullify the tariff. That means we won't collect it. He is arguing that a state has the right to nullify a federal law. <coughs> He's building on that Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that Madison and Jefferson did in the previous lecture. 
The president is furious. The president is going, you can't ignore a federal law. The federal government is superior to the state. That's what the court says today. But we didn't know it then. We didn't, we didn't have that, that understanding. So these nullies in South Carolina read Calhoun's letter, the exposition and protest, and this group of nullies pass a nullification act where they say, we're not collecting it. And if you don't like it, Mr. President, we'll just secede from the union. We'll leave the country. We'll form our own country. Get it to 1776, we'll do it again. You can imagine the president is not happy. And by the way, even though Calhoun wrote this anonymously, everybody knew he wrote it. Okay? His writing style was something that people recognized. It would be like if the Beatles wrote something and they didn't sign their name to it. We would all know what it is. Well, I know I'm old. I'm using the Beatles. I don't know any new bands. Uh, but <coughs> Jackson writes his own letter. It's not nearly as pretty as Calhoun's. Calhoun's was poetic. It was beautifully written. Jackson's is like in scratch. It's called the Proclamation of the People of South Carolina. And Jackson says, if you do not nullify your, your act, if you don't rescind your nullification act, I am going to personally lead an army into South Carolina and I'm going to hang the leaders of the nullification act. So I want you to think about this for a minute. The President of the United States has just said that he's going to lead an army into a state and hang the Vice President. Well, I mean, he didn't like really didn't like it. We are almost in a civil war right here. We should have had our civil war right here. If we would have had our civil war right here, we wouldn't have had it in 1861. Because guys, our civil war, guess where it breaks out at? South Carolina over this same issue. If we'd have let Jackson take care of it right then, we might not have had that problem. But Henry Clay rides in. That's him at the bottom right, the one that looks like Hillary Clinton. All right, so tell me I'm wrong. All right, so I'm sorry. Hillary Clinton and the Crypt Keeper and Henry Clay all look like the same person. So Henry Clay rides in. We call Henry Clay the great compromiser. Because over and over again, he comes in and reaches a compromise to prevent war. If he hadn't been dead in 1861, we might not have had the Civil War. But Henry Clay says, fine, this is what we're going to do. We're going to reduce that tariff even more. Over the next eight years, we're going to reduce it by another 10%. That's going to let the, the nullies believe that they're getting something for their... Uh, they're getting a victory. They're going to win. It's going to go down. But the other side of that was to give Jackson a, 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 a victory. They passed the force bill where they said, but here's the other side of that. If you don't, if, if they don't repeal the Secession Act or the Nullification Act, they gave Jackson the authority to lead that army in if he wants it. So basically they're saying, the ball's in your court, Carolina. We're going to reduce the tax. But either you repeal your law, or we're going to let Andrew Jackson loose on you. And we know, you know, you're liable to have the vice president shoved in a whiskey keg if you're not careful. South Carolina repealed the nullification ordinance. Both sides were able to claim victory. Pretty smart move, okay? Both sides claimed victory. We already talked about that. I'm not going to do it again. Uh, I already talked about that then. All right. We will pick up at the bank war next time because this is a natural stopping point and it's a kind of long section. All right? See you guys later. All right. So we're going to do the Age of Jackson part two here. Uh, well, I guess kind of part three from the way we had to break it up. And we're going to pick up with right after Andrew Jackson was elected in 1828, and Jackson's Bank War. This is the first of the great bank wars in American history. Now, 
when we think of a bank today, we think of, you know, going down to First National Bank or something like that. That's not the bank we're talking about. We're talking about the Bank of the United States. This was uh, a predecessor to, to the Federal Reserve, basically. It's something a little different than what, what, what we usually think of as a bank. And Jackson is not a fan of the Bank of the United States for a lot of reasons. Uh, the Bank of the United States had loaned a, uh, for years had been loaning money to farmers out west at pretty low interest rates. It was a good deal, but what it was causing was it was causing farmers to borrow more money than they needed to. They were buying vast amounts of land and gambling that the value of that land would go up. And it did for decades. So their thought was, we'll borrow all this money, the value of the land will go up, I'll sell the land, I'll take the profit, and then I'll pay it, off, pay it all off. They're literally gambling here. Well, at a certain point, you reach saturation in the market where you can't, you can't flip that land so easily, okay? There weren't buyers. And suddenly, the economy starts to slow down because people are stuck with this land and they couldn't make their payments. Well, the bank wants their money back, so the bank started recalling loans. Andrew Jackson was a victim of, of, of some of that, okay? So he's got a long-standing hatred of the Bank of the United States. He distrusts it in a lot of ways. Well, you got this guy, Henry Clay. We talked about him the other day. He introduced him as the great compromiser. He ran against Andrew Jackson in 24. Uh, Henry Clay of Kentucky, the Speaker, the Speaker of the House, the guy who kind of sold Andrew Jackson out in the corrupt bargain, made John Quincy Adams president. Well, Henry Clay is going to rear his head again. Henry Clay wants to be the next president of the United States. The problem is Andrew Jackson is incredibly popular. So how do you go about making a name for yourself and embarrassing Andrew Jackson? So he decides in 1832 that he's going to push through a rechartering of the Bank of the United States. The Bank of the United States was chartered in 20-year charters. Now, if you don't know what that means, it means that the uh, Congress agreed to create this bank, but they said, look, we're gonna open it for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, we have to either decide whether it stays open or we shut this down. It's a little early. This bank actually doesn't expire until 1836, but he's, he's going through it in 1832, he says, we're gonna recharter it early. And here was his logic. He's trying to force Jackson to make a decision. It was a political game. Half the country likes the bank and half the country hates the bank. If he makes Jackson do something, he's gonna make half the country mad no matter what he does. And what they expected Jackson to do was to kind of quietly sign the bill and hope nobody notices. But with what we know about Andrew Jackson, would you expect Andrew Jackson to do anything quietly? This is the guy that shoved the guy in a whiskey barrel and mailed it back to the King of England after the Battle of New Orleans, okay? This is the guy that killed three men in duels for insulting his wife. He is not one to do something quietly. So instead, he very vocally, very, very loudly vetoed the bill and said, I'm vetoing it because it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court disagreed with him. Justice Marshall told, came, came out and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Jackson, you're wrong. Mr. President, you are mistaken. It's not unconstitutional. Well, Jackson says in my reading of the Constitution, it is vetoed. And Americans kind of like it. Yeah, it, 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 people in the East that liked it might not have liked the fact that he vetoed it, but we like a gunslinger president, okay? It's part of our, it's part of this American mentality. We like the idea of a guy, now we as a culture, like the idea of a guy that shoots first and asks, asks questions later. That's Andrew Jackson. And by him coming out and just, 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 just doing this out in the open, he was standing for something. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, our whole economy was built around this bank of the United States. And something has to replace this federal bank. 
You can't just have nothing. So if you don't have a national bank, what can you have instead? You can have state banks. Okay? And there were a bunch of state banks, and he took the money out of the national bank and started putting it in these state banks all over the country. Here's the problem. The state banks weren't really as stable as the national bank. They weren't as well run as the national bank was. So there's going to be some issues with it. I like this cartoon that we have up here. This is an editorial cartoon uh, that ran in some pro-Jackson newspapers. And I don't know if you can tell what it is or not. Uh, I know it's on your blackboard so you can see it better on your computers. But this is Jackson slaying the dragon. And the dragon is the Bank of the United States. And it's this terrible multi-headed beast that was going to destroy the world. And he's, he's cutting off the head of this, this multi-headed dragon. And behind him, you see he's dragging somebody. That's a guy named Nicholas Biddle. He was the leader of the Bank of the United States, okay? So this isn't going to end things immediately, okay? Yes, he vetoed it. But remember, Henry Clay tried to recharter the bill four years early. So vetoing it doesn't just shut the bank down. It just says, we're not rechartering you. So the Bank of the United States now has four years to make Andrew Jackson's life as miserable as possible. Okay? And this guy, Nicholas Biddle, is really good at that. Biddle was actually a pretty good uh, leader of the bank. He, uh, he was, uh, most economists will look at what he did and say, he, he did some pretty smart things. He didn't loan money uh, in dangerous ways. He didn't run interest rates up. He was a pretty responsible person, but he's still going to be the target of, of Andrew Jackson. Well, he decides to fire back, and he began loaning money from the Bank of the United States to anti-Jackson newspapers in order to uh, keep them open so they could run these terrible articles about Andrew Jackson. So I want you to think about that for a minute. This is a time period when the president of the Bank of the United States could give a loan of U.S. money to a newspaper for the sole purpose of writing bad things about the president of the United States. So a newspaper that is, is attacking the president is being financed by the government. It's an interesting idea. Well, Jackson's not going to like that either. So what do you do? Jackson's not one to stand still. He could just sit there and deal with things. But he says, you know what? Four years is too long to deal with this. So instead of just waiting, he'd already killed the bank. It's already going to die. But instead of waiting for a slow death, we want to kill it real quick. So Jackson withdraws all of the federal funds from him. He's just going to bankrupt it. He's just going to bankrupt the, the, uh, the, the program. And he redistributes this money to his pet banks. It's a term I want you to know. Uh, it's not a real term. It's not a technical term. But it's a term that historians use a lot. A pet bank is just a state bank that was loyal to Jackson. Okay? My little pet banks. Think of Andrew Jackson petting his little 